All right. Well, I told you guys I was going to tell a story. Where's all the kids at? Raise your hand if you're a kid. Any kids in this room? Come on, adults. You're still kids in some ways too, right? I'm going to tell you a story. And I made this story up. I wrote it myself. So I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to walk around while I tell it so they try to engage the kids. Um, And this is going to lead us into our Bible teaching for today. All right. So here's a story I want to tell you about, little kids. There is a story that I made up in my brain about a little orphan girl who had something wonderful happen in her life, but her life started off very sad and very challenging. Well, this little girl never knew who her mother or her father was. Can you kids imagine that? You don't even remember what your mom or dad's face looked like. What a sad way to start your life. Well, this girl lived in the streets and alleys of this town, and she had to scrounge for all of her food. She had to raid dumpsters. She had to raid trash cans. She had to find where raccoons were getting their food, and sometimes she would just get down and dirty with animals to get her meals. This was a hard life for her, but it became her norm. It became normal for this little orphan girl. Well, about eight years old, she did something she never thought she would do. She began stealing. And first, she just began stealing things that she said, I need this. I need this apple. And she would steal it. She'd go into a store. She found a way to steal and put it in her pocket where no one could see it and then walk out really quietly before anyone could notice. Sometimes she thought she'd almost get caught, so she'd begin running. One time, she even had a big, scary man chase her, yelling at her and saying terrible things, calling her a stupid little orphan girl. What a terrible thing to call someone. But her, her stealing habit was getting worse and worse, and she began not just stealing food, but stealing shoes and clothes and toys and all kinds of stuff until she had what's called a chronic stealing problem. She, was, she had become a thief. Well, this little orphan girl, she, she had a little place to live. It wasn't that special, but it was up on top of a building. She found that if she climbed this little ladder and then climbed up the gutter, she could get all the way up to the top of this roof on top of a building where no one, no one would bother her up there. And she had a really quiet place where she could just lay there and think. And at night, she'd think about what it would be like to have a family, what, to have, what it would be like to have a mommy and a daddy. How many of you guys have a mommy and daddy you get to see before bed? Wow, what a gift. Well, this girl, she'd think about, what would that be like if I had a mom and a dad? What would it be like if I didn't have to steal my food, but I could just get served my food and I could get hugs at night? But then this thing would happen. Every time she'd start thinking about that, some other thoughts would come into her brain and she'd say, you know what? You don't deserve any of that. You're just a stupid, dirty, little orphan girl. Can you believe she talked to herself like that? And then you know what she'd say? She said, I, I've done so many evil things. I've done so much stealing. I don't even deserve to be in a family. No one would want me. I'm not worthy of anyone's love. Well, kids, I don't know if you know what that is, but that right there is called shame. When you have these negative thought patterns in your brain that say you're not worthy of love, that's called shame. And she would have that every night as she'd get in her little bed. It wasn't a nice bed, but it was warm enough for her to, you know, not freeze at night. And that was the the self-talk that she'd go to bed with every night. Well, one day when she was about 10, she she would go to this donut store frequently. How many kids like donuts? Anyone here like donuts? Oh, sorry, parents. It's got a lot of donut confessors in here. They like the sugar. Anyways, this girl, she liked donuts too. She knew they probably weren't healthy for her, but they sure tasted yummy. And she would go sometimes around the back and see if there were any old donuts in the dumpster from the day before. Sometimes she'd go into the donut store and see if there were any donuts on a plate that hadn't gotten served yet that she could steal. And one thing she loved is there's lots of kids at the donut store. And she would listen to them as they walked around and told little stories to each other. And she overheard the kids talking about a faraway land where nobody was an orphan. The first time she heard that, she thought, that can't be possible. All I've seen my whole life is orphans. All over my town, orphans. All my life I've been an orphan. How could there be a land with no orphans? And she got a little closer. And the kids, they didn't really accept her because she was stinky. She didn't have a way to take a bath. Her clothes were all dirty. She didn't have new clothes. But she would listen to them, and they'd say, yeah, there's this land where every child gets a family. And every child gets food, and every child gets fresh clothes and toys, and every child gets a house. And she'd listen to that, and she'd think, that sounds amazing. 
But then you know what would happen? Her shame would come right back into her brain and say, you know what? Even if that land is real, you don't deserve it because you're not worthy of love. You've stolen too many things. No family would want you. She'd say those things to herself. How many of you guys feel a little sad for this little girl? A little sad, huh? Well, one day at the donut shop, she heard the kids talking about a boat, a big boat that every Tuesday would depart from her city and would take supplies to this land where there's no orphans. And all the children thought that would be wonderful to find a way to sneak onto that boat. And one of the kids said, I heard there was a kid that snuck onto that boat and went to this land and found a family and never came back here to the streets to scrounge and to steal. That's what the little kid said. You guys think it was true? I don't know. She heard that. And usually she would talk herself out of such nonsense and say, that's not true, that's not possible, and I don't deserve it. But this time, something in her heart said she needed to find out for herself. So what this little girl did is she snuck out in the middle of the night, snuck down the ladder, climbed down the gutter of her little house on top of the apartment building, and she went to where the boat was parked at the dock, and she climbed up the drawbridge and snuck down below where all the stinky fish were and supplies that were taken to this land. It's very stinky, but she, she was around stinky stuff a lot, so it didn't bother her. And she climbed right down there among all the stinky fish and stinky food, and there were rats running around, but she was used to all that. She got right down there with all the yucky stuff and hid under that boat deck, dock deck, port, something like that. I don't know my boat parts very well. Starboard. She was under there. And she slept there for a whole night as this boat left late that night and traveled all the way to this faraway land. Well, she woke up, and she could see light peering in through the cracks in the ship, and she came out to look around, and she knew she'd have to be quick if she was going to run off the ship. She didn't want to get caught by someone who was angry at her for, for uh, smuggling herself on a boat. So she peeked around, and she ran as fast as she could and ran down the bridge and ran into this land, and then she stopped and just looked around and went, wow. This place is beautiful. There were trees and gardens and flowers, and most of all, lots of families with children. She saw mommies and daddies with their children, and she thought, this place looks amazing. This place looks amazing. Now, she had taught her heart not to get too excited because she'd been disappointed many times in her life, but she couldn't help herself. She was getting so excited. She went straight to the first restaurant she saw on the Embarcadero, this line of cute little shops right on the waterway. And she went in and thought, man, this place looks great. I'm going to probably steal myself some food. Old habits, right? She still had old habits. She didn't know she wouldn't need those here in this land. She walked in and saw this beautiful, delicious meal on these beautiful plates. How many of you guys have ever seen beautiful plates that are just as pretty as the food? That's how this restaurant was. Well, she walked over to it, and she looked around to make sure no one was looking. And she began to steal it just like she would. But then she heard a, a man with a gentle voice behind her, and he said, you don't need to steal that. And she started to get scared, but there was something in his voice that was not scary. It was not intimidating, and it didn't sound like he wanted to punish her. So he tur she turned and looked into his eyes, and he handed her some money and said, here's some money. You can pay for that meal, and there's enough here to give a tip. How many kids know what a tip is? It's when you give the person a little bit of extra money, not just the cost. Yep. Well, she did that. She had never paid for food in her whole life. She'd never done that before. She gave the clerk the money and the tip, and the person said, thank you. She ate her delicious meal, and then she walked down. As she was walking out of the restaurant, the man with the gentle voice came to her and said, you know, you don't need to steal anymore in this land. She looked at him, and she looked down at the floor, and looked at her clothes with rags and holes, and her shame came right back into her brain. And she said, you don't know what I've done. And she ran away. She ran away. Well, she went to the beach. There's beautiful beaches in this land. She found some nice, beautiful palm trees with coconuts, and she took a nap under that palm tree and enjoyed a whole day at the beach and a whole night at the beach. She camped there all by herself. It was very nice compared to her windy rooftop apartment in her old place. Well, the next morning, she woke up hungry for breakfast and went to the same restaurant. And old habits, she thought again, I probably have to steal to get my breakfast. And she went up to this table and began to steal this breakfast, and she heard the same voice the man with the gentle voice behind her, and he said, you don't need to steal anymore. And he reached in his pocket to give her some cash, and then he said, wait a minute. And then he pulled something out of his wallet. He pulled this little card called a debit card. How many of you guys know what a credit card or a debit card is? Any kids know what that is? 
Yeah, your parents, there's a lot of, there's good and bad things about that. Your parents will help you work that out, hopefully before you get in college. Um, but sometimes there's a responsible way to use a debit card. And this very nice man with this gentle voice said, here, I want you to use this. This is so you can buy food whenever you're hungry. And she looked up and she said, why would you do that for me? And he said, that's how it is in this land. Kids don't need a steal, and kids can have all the food that they need. Well, she got her meal and gave a tip with the man's debit card, very generous. And <laughs> then she ate her delicious meal and began to leave the restaurant. But as she was leaving, the man with the gentle voice followed her off out, outside and said, Hey, I'd like you to come to my house where my family lives tonight for dinner. And she started to smile, but her shame told her not to get too excited. She looked down at her dirty clothes and said, I don't have anything nice to wear. And he said, don't worry, I have plenty of dresses and shoes that will fit you just fine. Now, kids, I want to ask you a question. If you meet a creepy stranger, should you go to his house without asking your parents? No. But this girl didn't have any parents. So it was perfectly legitimate for her to make her own choice. And she said in her heart, there's something just very different about this man's voice. There's something when I look into his eyes that doesn't feel creepy. Now, I don't want you kids to make that decision without your parents and go to strangers' houses. But she took a risk. And that night, she followed uh, the address that was provided, and she went to his house. And she knocked on the door, wearing her dirty rags and her dirty old shoes, and smelling stinky, hasn't taken a bath for a long time, knocked on the door. <laughs> and this man's children came to the door to greet her. And they had balloons, and they'd all made her nice little cards that they drew. And they welcomed her in. And they took her hand, and they showed her around their big house. They showed all the toys they have to play with. They showed her the kitchen where all the food is. They walked by all their bedrooms, and they walked by a bedroom that was strange. It was empty except for a nice dress on the bed with a nice pair of shoes. Well, this little girl looked in there and then quickly walked away. She thought, surely that's not a room that I could live in. Then she heard the, 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 the man of the house in his gentle voice call all of his children for dinner, and she went up to the table, and they all sat down, and they began to eat and talk about the wonderful life they have here in this land where everyone has a family. No one has to steal. And as they were eating their meal, the man looked over at the little girl and said, we decided we would like for you to be part of our family. And this little girl got so excited that she, she had happy tears. How many of you have ever had happy tears before? Raise your hand if you've ever had happy tears. That's kind of a weird thing maybe you think. Maybe that doesn't happen very much for you, but sometimes it happens at a really special moment in your life. Maybe when you had a little brother be born or a little sister be born. Some people have happy tears at moments like that. Sometimes when you're worshiping Jesus and you feel the Holy Spirit, you get happy tears. So anyways, this little girl started to get happy tears, but then her tears turned sad. And she said, nobody would really want me in their family if they really knew who I was. And at that moment, she got up from the table and she walked outside. She didn't know where to run. and She could barely make it out past the front yard where she sat down near a creek and sat on a rock and just cried. Well, it wasn't long before she heard the voice of the man with the gentle voice. And he said, you know what you said at the table is not true. She said, what do you mean? You don't know anything about my life. I have stolen so many things. I'm a terrible thief, and nobody would want me in their family. He said, you know, in this land, we forgive people who have made mistakes in their past. And she said, I can understand that, but in my own land, I've stolen so many things that I probably need to go to jail. And you know what this man said? He said something that she really didn't expect. He said, well, in this land, we have a different system. We have a courthouse, and I want to tell you something. I went to the courthouse today to check on your past, and what would happen if I paid all the money for all the crimes that you've ever done, all the things you've ever stolen, and I paid the courthouse all the money for all the things you've stolen, and the courthouse said, you are now a free little girl, and you can join a family. She said, oh, my goodness, is this true? And she had the happy tears run down her face again. And all the kids ran out of the house, and she said, yes, I will join your family. And the man said, well, this is wonderful. We have a dress for you to put on. It's on your bed in your very own room and your shoes. And the girl ran into her room and got her new dress on and her new shoes on and had a great celebration that night with her new family. She never had to steal another thing again. She never had to go to jail, and she never had to have that shame talk in her head ever again. Well, that's the end of my story. How many of you guys like that story? I think that was a wonderful story about a little girl. All right, kids. Well, I'm going to talk.
talk uh, to the adults, and you guys can listen too, but I'm going to read some Bible verses, and if you get bored or lose focus, you can go back and just play with the tables, because sometimes I lose focus too, so that's perfectly okay, but you guys, it's so good listening to my story. Thank you. So I'm going to read some verses to the adults now as we get ready for this baptism. Uh, usually, we seem to be going through the book of Genesis, and I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to read to you a scripture from 2 Corinthians, and this is from 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And I promise you this is semi-related to my story I just told. So the, this is a verse that the Apostle Paul wrote in one of his letters to a church in the city of Corinth. And I think some of you have probably heard this verse before, at least parts of it. Here's what it says. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. How many of you guys think that verse is familiar? Has anyone heard this or heard any part of this before? Uh, the, a lot of the um, Bible translators will pick words that are similar but slightly different to interpret the Scripture. So here's what the English Standard Version says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So this is a Scripture that you probably have heard maybe in the context of people teaching you how to view yourself. If you've become a Christian, it's really important that you learn to see yourself the way God sees you and not the way you saw yourself previously or the way other people see you. That's called your identity. Um, in the world, we talk a lot about reputation, but in the church, we talk more about identity because we don't receive our reputation through anything that we've done or could do or haven't done, we receive our reputation or our identity from God the Father. And this verse is saying that if we are in Christ, that if we become a tr someone who trusts in Jesus, a Christian, someone who's in Christ, that everything from our past goes away. Now, that's really hard for people to believe. You might say, how could everything from my past go away? How can all my mistakes go away? How can all my years of trauma and drama and conflict and sins, how can all my years of rebellion and confusion and deception and pain and sorrow, how can all that go away? Because it does, and that's what God says. And His Word is bigger than our Word. His Word is truer than our Word. His identity is truer than your identity. Well, when we read the Bible, one thing we have to pay attention to is context. That means what's happening in the passage, what's happening in the story. And whenever we see the word therefore, it means we're supposed to go back and read what they were talking about before. So since this verse I read to you starts with therefore, I think I need to read to you the verses before so we can really understand what Paul's trying to teach us. So let's read verse 16. So Paul says, therefore, oh boy, he says it again, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. I wanted to read this verse also in the NLT. It says, So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. Well, what's this saying? This is really interesting because what Paul's saying is this whole concept of becoming new creations is not just for you to learn how to think about yourself. It's for you to learn how to think about other people. That's actually what he was saying in the scripture. And I'm, I'm happy if you've learned to see yourself as a new creation. That's awesome. Congratulations. But that was not his primary objective in this context. Do you know what he was doing? He was encouraging the church of Corinth to start seeing people the way God sees them, not the way they see people. Because they were having a problem in this area. A lot of the letters that Paul writes that we now have canonized in the Bible, they were letters that he was writing to churches that were having problems. How many think churches have problems sometimes? Put your hands down if you're part of this church. Stop it. How dare you accuse churches of having problems? I can't believe you would do that. I'm deeply offended. But yes, churches had problems back in the Bible times, and supposedly they do still today sometimes because they're filled with people like you and me. And I don't know. We sometimes make mistakes, sometimes we get confused, sometimes we do things for the wrong reasons. And anyways, Paul says that's not the point, though. The point is that if someone's in Christ, we need to see them the new way, not the old way. We need to see them based on how God sees them, not on how we see them or saw them. We need new glasses. We need new lenses. 
We need a new ability with the eyes inside of our heart to see people the way God sees them. Yeah, we need to see ourselves that way too, but we especially do it with other people. Now, Paul, this is kind of interesting to you because you might have a lot of respect for this man. Did you know Paul wrote much of your Bible? He wrote a lot of these letters that we have that we call the epistles. Uh, He also has stories about him, how he came to know Jesus. Can I tell you something about Paul? When he became a Christian, the church people didn't want nothing to do with him. When Paul became a Christian, the guy who wrote your Bible, the church people were saying, we don't trust this guy. We know too much about him. He's done too much bad stuff. He's been violent. He's been aggressive. He's been a persecutor. That means someone who attacks Christians. He was uh, going to get letters from chief officials to take them to try to find Christians and sneak around and take them out of their houses, separating families, dragging them to prison. This man was violent. This guy was a murderous, threatening uh, attacker of Christians. That's who this guy was. That was his past. Let me be honest. If he walked into the church today in that state, many of you would say, "Uh uh-uh, sorry, buddy. We accept a lot of people, but not your type. Don't sit by me and my kids. You sit somewhere else. We got a different place for you, and it ain't in here. I'm just saying you might be tempted to think like that. We'd put his name on a list. We'd put it on the internet. we say, you don't come near us. He's the guy who wrote a lot of your Bible, and he's the guy writing this scripture that tells you we need to learn to see people differently when they become a Christian. We need to see them the way God sees them. We need to see them as a new creation, not the old thing, the new creation. We need to see that all the old stuff, even their achievements in the past, they were good with money. They were good at their job. They had a beautiful family. They were great at athletics. They were really fit and healthy and had great intellectualism. All these things that we would judge them by, good or bad, gone. And now we see them as who they are in Christ. We see them as no longer an orphan, but part of his family. We see them as no longer guilty, but forgiven, clean, and set free with a clean track record. We see them as no no longer needing to measure up through their own behavior, but redeemed, sanctified, and accepted by God in heaven. That's what it means to be a new creation. I want to read some more of this because Paul keeps saying, therefore. He says it too many times for me to count. But I'm going to read to you a little more of this context so you can see what he was saying. Verse 11 Paul says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. I always like to tell you, there's there's a healthy fear of God and there's an unhealthy fear of God. An unhealthy fear makes you run away from God. A healthy fear of God makes you run to him even when you're not feeling it. There's a healthy way to fear God because he is holy, good, righteous, and just, and he is the judge, and all will stand before him. So there's a healthy reason to fear God. And Paul says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade people, men and women. But then he says something else, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we're made manifest also in your consciences. Remember, he's writing to the church with the problems, the Corinthian church. I wanted to read this in a different translation. Since then, we know that what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it's also plain to your conscience. Another translation, what we are is known to God. I hope it's known also to your consciences. You know what Paul's saying? He's saying, I've come to believe that God knows exactly who I am. No one else gets me sometimes, but God gets me. How many of you guys have ever had to come to that place before? Not everyone in my life gets me. Not everyone in my life perceives me. Not everyone in my life measures me the right way, but God does. God knows who I am. And Paul's saying, that's where I'm at. God knows me. God knows who I am. And God accepts me. And God loves me. And that's enough. But I hope you'll learn to see me the way God sees me. That's what Paul's saying. Isn't that cool? And I think it's cool that he makes it kind of personal here, even though he's teaching them and giving us this exhortation. Verse 12, we are not again commending ourselves to you, but we're giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you'll have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. Verse 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of sound mind, it's for you. I'm going to give you a little explanation of what Paul's saying. He's, he's, he's speaking to the, the rumors that people have spread about him, that Paul is this wild man, that he's out of his mind. Some people would say he's not very strong. He's not a strong speaker, that he is too quiet and too soft when he's around them. He can't be a good leader. There's all kinds of accusations against this man, Paul. He's not a real apostle. He's not one of the 12 He wasn't originally with Jesus. All kinds of things people said and probably could have said about Paul. 
And what he's saying is, look, I'm not here to justify myself. That's not my job. God does that. But I want you to be able to back us up when you're in that situation and say, no, we don't see Paul that way anymore. We see him as one in Christ. And Paul says, if we're beside ourselves, it's for God. If, it's, if we're of sound mind, it's for you. Paul's saying, I know sometimes I look a little crazy. Newsflash, you Christians, you look a little crazy sometimes too. Raising your hands, waving your hands, singing Jesus songs to someone you can't even see. Reading your Bible, saying no to things that everyone else says yes to. Saying yes to things that everyone else says no to. Some of you look crazy sometimes too. But Paul's saying, we're not doing it for how we look. We're doing it for the Lord and we're doing it for others. Paul says, I'm doing this for you. Verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us, compels us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And Paul says, this is where we started. Therefore, this is the therefore, from now on we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, Yet now we know him in this way no longer. And therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Hey, friends, I want to ask you this question today. Are you going to do this? I want to ask you this question. Are you going to see people when they come to Christ the way God sees them? Some of you, the question needs to be turned right back at yourself. Are you going to see yourself the way God sees you? God wants his kids back. God wants his family back. God wants his orphans to become his sons and his daughters. God doesn't want you eating below his table, scratching for crumbs and respect from the world. He wants you to eat at his table. Will you see yourself the way God sees you? Will you stop judging and measuring yourself the ways you've done that in the past? Will you stop holding the past against yourself? Because he doesn't anymore. He died for your sins. He died for your past. Are you ready to accept that? and live in the new today, in the new future. That's what it means to be a new creation. That's what it means to see other people as new creations in Christ. You guys ready for baptism? Oh, this is going to be good. So what we're going to do here is something that, we didn't make this up, by the way. This is something we see in the pages of Scripture. There's many beautiful stories and, it's, and some instruction about baptism. And it's, it's special, but I don't want you to think it's... Um, I don't want you to think it's the whole. Um, what it really is is a decree, a declaration, in some ways a symbol, but I believe it's more than that, of what's happened in somebody's heart. Not your heart that pumps blood and makes your lungs beat and do all that stuff, but the, you know, the part, the metaphysical, the part where you trust in God and believe in God and desire and the heart that can make those kind of big decisions about who God is and who you are. So what baptism is, is it's this outward act of an inward decision. So the Bible says that when you become a Christian and you become in Christ, that you're a new creation, that you left the old stuff on the cross with Jesus, in the grave with Jesus. And just as Jesus rose again from the grave, you also have this resurrection and you become a new person. And it doesn't mean you have to feel it. It just means you have to believe it. And you might say, well, I've had a lot of moments where I trusted God in my life. That's probably true, and that's awesome. I, I know so many of your guys' stories about where God showed up in your life, and I believe me, I love those stories. But the Bible says there's actually a moment. There is a moment in each person's life, in each Christian's life, where they trust Jesus, and he sees that as saving faith. And at that moment, you get saved. You get rescued by Jesus. You become his all the sins go away. Even the ones you're still doing, they're forgiven. I know that's hard to explain, and some of your upbringings taught you otherwise. The Bible says sins, past, present, and future, get God's blood and forgiveness washing over them. That is really good news. You become His, and you have a future with Him, relationship on this earth, and an eternity with Him in heaven. That is the good news. So all that baptism is, it is showing that this is really who I am now, I need to not just make this private and secret. I need my church family to know this. I need the world to know this. This ain't supposed to be private. This is public. I'm going to go under the water, and then I'm going to come back up, and I want everyone to celebrate with me who I am in Christ and what God's done in my heart and in my life. Can you guys participate with us today in this? All right. All right, cool. So, hey, D Dad, can you come up and help me? And uh, can, Dad, can you find a microphone if you don't have one? 
And then I think we're going to go ahead and start with Mr. Tony Ramos. Can everyone give him a soft round of applause for Tony? Cool. All right. Can everyone see this handsome man up here? All right. Oh, so many of you, uh, if you've met Tony, you know he's a treat. He's really special. <laughs> and um, if you haven't met him yet, I hope you get to know him because he really is. So this is Tony Ramos, and what a privilege it is to meet him. He, one of the um, church members in this church, she helped deliver his first baby, Precious Ruth over there. And uh, when she met these guys, she said, hey, why don't you come visit my church? And I think that's how it went, something like that. And then they rolled in with their beautiful new baby and, you know, um, just let us get to know them over the last year. And, and it's been really special to watch Tony and his wife, his whole family, uh, just in a journey over the last year. It's been about a full year um, of just seeking, seeking God. Man, this guy is not messing around. Like, I'll tell you what, some of you guys... I don't want it. This sounds so bad. Some of you are just like, you'll believe anything I say. This guy doesn't, man. He takes this, he takes this very seriously. And I get text messages from him and phone calls, and we, we hash things out. This guy's like, if this is legit, I want to really know because I'm going to put my life in this if this is real. This guy's taking this very seriously. And so that's why I'm proud to be part of this moment today, Tony, because I know you've, you've really, not just your brain, but your heart has also done some deep work in saying, am, am I ready to give my life to Jesus? I'm ready to do this, I, and I'm, I'm confident that uh, that's happened in your heart, and this is legit for you, that this isn't just a show, this isn't just a baptism ceremony, this is, this is legit for you. So, Dad, why don't you bring uh, the mic closer, I want to ask Tony a couple questions. Um, so, Tony, the first question I want to ask you is, you know, have you come to a place where you personally, you trust in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Yes. Okay. Tony, um, have you come to a place where you have decided that you will, for the rest of your life, follow him? Yes. Okay. Uh, hey, Tony, do you, I need to know this. Do you believe that Jesus, with his blood, has washed away all of your sins, past, present, and future? Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> cool. Hey, um, before we dunk you, do you want to share with, with your church family anything about where you're at or how you got here? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was raised in the church. Um, my dad was a pastor when I was growing up. And, um, but as a kid, I just I felt like I didn't understand uh, just Jesus and um, the church. I felt like I got it a little bit, like the community aspect of it, but I really didn't understand. Um, and I didn't. I read the Bible a little bit as like a teenager, maybe like the book of Revelation or something. And, but yeah, I never really understood it. And, um, but this last year, I've, uh, since Ruth was born, we, we started reading the book of Ruth. And, <laughs> and it was just so powerful just how Ruth, um, the character Ruth, who is, um, I think, the great grandmother of King David, but um, how she was just so loyal to her mother-in-law that, um, that she loved her so much that she wanted the, her mother-in-law's people to be her people and her God to be, to be her God. Come on. Uh, so th I think that love that we show to others, I think is really important to gain people to Christ, to the body of Christ, that, um, that we should just be like a shining light that you know, of love that they are just drawn to, that they're going to be so in love with you that they're like, what, like, what is this? Like, do you, how are you like this? You know, like, why are you so, like, so good, like positive and just such a shining light in my life? So I think that story really um, impacted me and um, just to pursue God because Ruth was saying, you know, I'm going to go wherever you go, I'll go, you know, like, don't leave me. I want to stay with you. And so um, just, I think that pursuit of God, when you feel his love, then to just keep going after him and just to um, keep reading the word and just, um, yeah, there's just so many powerful things in there. It's awesome. Yeah, so I've read like almost the entire Bible this last year and, uh, multiple times just going over it over and over 
um, reading whole books, uh, and yeah, it's just been really powerful. And it's just, you can just see how God stays the same throughout the ages, that he reveals himself to mankind, you know, from the beginning of recorded history until now, today. Uh, like doing a baptism here, God, I think, reveals himself as wanting us to be cleansed before we come to him. In the book of Leviticus, it shows that, um, you know, God commands Moses that Aaron as the high priest, should wash himself before going into the Holy of Holies. And then, like, in the book of Esther, um, Esther has to perfume herself for, like, a whole year before she can approach the king um, because that was just part of their culture was, like, to be, before you approach the Lord or, like, the king, that you should be cleansed. And mm. so today, I think, is um, a symbol of me to really just cleanse my life of the kind of the sin and the just the baggage that I've kind of kept over the years of um, just the shame that I feel of being a bad influence on people or, you know, influencing people to do, you know, drugs or alcohol or whatever. And just like, uh, it hurts me sometimes to think that I've influenced people in bad ways, but um you know, someone was reminding me that that's the power of being saved is that that stuff has been washed away. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Thanks for sharing that. Do you have anything in this? Do you want to read or no? Um, well, yeah, it's going to get wet if you take it in there. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I'll just read um, just a little couple passages in um, Leviticus sixteen twenty four. It just uh, it's um, God speaking to Moses, and he's saying, and he shall walk, uh, talking about Aaron, and he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place, and put on his garments, and come forth, and offer his burnt offering, and the burnt offering of the people, and make an atonement for himself, and for the people. Come on, all right, Tony, let's get you in here. <laughs> Electronics. Anything that will cause an electrocution? Okay. Well, hey, Tony, this is, this is really special, and I'm, we're really proud of you. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're thankful that God has drawn you. You know, we know that you, you've put your mind and your heart into this, but he's the one who, who chose you, and he's, he's selected you to be part of his family. So this is the will of God. It's not the will of man. And uh, we're, that's why we're baptizing you. Based on your confession in Christ, your, your, your uh, pronouncement to follow him the rest of your life, now we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <sighs> <All right. laughs> okay, so, hey, church family, what we like to do now is we like to have uh, maybe two or three people uh, say a prayer for Tony. Sometimes God speaks to you, things to bless him, pray over him. So you can go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll come to you. Here's another towel. You're all wet. So, okay, let's bring a, a mic back here. Here's the first one. So much for Tony and his family, Elise and Ruth. What a blessing to have them join us, Lord, and just to see them grow. And thank you uh, for his heritage. I've met his father. He's a godly man. And, um, I've, you know, even though, uh, you know, Tony uh, took kind of a winding path, you know, obviously you planted seeds, and uh, that heritage is important. And thank you for that. And um, uh, just thank you for bringing them to, uh, to our congregation here. And most importantly, thank you for bringing them into your uh, eternal family. And um, just thank you for their um, courage to uh, stand up and make their commitment today and for Tony to, to uh, share his heart with us. Um, just what a blessing to have them as part of us, Lord. Thank you so much. Amen. Anyone else? Just raise your hand and we can come to you if you want to say a prayer for Tony.
Jesus, I just thank you for Tony's testimony, God, for his heart to uh, to be your light, um, to show your love, God. And I just pray that um, that there would just be such um, such a drawn to him of people who want to know you, Jesus. I just pray that you would use his business um, as his lampstand, God, that he would just be able to shine your love to every person that he um, serves uh, a meal to, Jesus, that, that you would just bless that ministry. And I just thank you, God, for his heart, and I just, I just pray a blessing over his family, God, and I just I thank you for his hunger. Um, I just, yeah, I thank you for it in my life and for just how that blesses our community here um, in our church and the community has outside of this church, God, that that hunger would spread and that people would be drawn to you. So I just thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing um, in his and Elise and Ruth's life, God, to just bless that. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for Tony, and we thank you for um, the way you have never let him go. You have pursued him all over the world, at least all over the nation. And um, I thank you, God, that uh, you knew you would get him. And uh, I thank you for the plans and the purposes you have for him, God. And I just want to ask now that the Holy Spirit would come... And fill Tony from head to toe. I pray you'd pour out the fullness of Christ and the fullness of the Holy Spirit on him. I pray you'd baptize him as you have, as we have in water. You would baptize him with the Holy Spirit, God, and with fire. I ask God that you would give him your heart for people. I pray. I thank you for the heart you've given him for his family, God. I pray that you'd give him your heart for those that aren't in your family yet. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. God, I pray every time he sees little Ruth, his daughter, he would be reminded of how you have brought him into your family. And you would just forevermore, Lord, increase his passion for you, for righteousness, for holiness, for intimacy with you and with his family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, everyone, celebrate the new creation, Tony Yay. Ramos. Elise, come on up. You stay up here, too. All right. Well, now we get to baptize Elise, the other half of this wonderful power couple. This business-running, baby-making, light-spreading couple. <laughs> so, hey, Elise, here we are. Wow. So, so this is really special because, um, you know, I remember seeing you guys stroll in, and you know, you know, I I, I try to be really, um, I try to be really gentle when I'm preaching the word. But I always look up and I see this really happy, smiley face in the back, just soaking everything in for the last year, just like thinking, "Am I ready to do this?" And I can just see you, you've taken this seriously, and like you, you know, you you've you have over time gradually opened your heart to Jesus, and it, you didn't do it all immediately. You just throw yourself at him. You're like, hey. I need to really, my, this needs to happen. And he, he's opened your heart, Elise, and you've let him in. And he's done his part, and you've done your part. So this is really special. It's exciting that we get to all acknowledge what God's done in your life and what you've done with your heart, giving it open to Jesus. So, um, Elise, I always like to ask these questions, and I already know the answer, but I think everyone needs to hear them, and I want to hear you say them. Elise, have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Yes. Um, do you believe that he has forgiven all of your sins? Yes. Okay. And Elise, is it your intention to follow him with his help the rest of your days? Yes. Okay. Is there anything you want, you want to share or before we dunk you? Um, yeah, I just wanted to share my gratitude for everyone in this room and uh, just for helping me along my journey, uh, for my husband, Tony, he's just leading our family in this faith, and uh, it's, yeah, it's been a journey, like you said, and I feel like, you know, through becoming a mother 
and having Ruth, that Jesus really started to work on my heart like a lot this past year because all my life I feel like I've just had to do everything like alone and Jesus was right there like ready to help me and I'm just ready for that. So yeah. you're not alone anymore, are you? Yeah. He found you. You might never be alone again. Yeah. It's <laughs> awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, well all right. Is it, if it, and if there's nothing else for you to share, I'd like you to go ahead and step into the baptism tub. So. Okay. Okay, we're going to need three people on this one. You ready? So we want to make sure we don't leave you down there too long. Okay. Air is kind of important. <laughs> All right. Well, at least because of your confession of your faith in Jesus and um, your decision to trust him and follow him the rest of your life, this is why we now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right. Well, you can step on out. Yeah. And now uh, let's pray for Elias. You can raise your hand if, and we can come to you with a microphone. Okay, here's one over here. This is so cool. I love this. So, Father, I thank you for uh, Elise. I thank you for Tony. I think as he was being baptized, he's a fisher of men. He's comfortable handling your word, and his word is richly in him. And the word, the name Elise means beautiful soul. And you're truly a beautiful soul. So thank you, God, for the transformation. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for this couple. Just pray your kingdom will and kingdom purposes would be accomplished in their life and their children. In Jesus' name, amen. Anyone else like to pray for Elise? There's one over here. Lord, I thank you for this special lady. I thank you for the call on her life. I thank you that you knew her before the foundation of the world. And you said, I love Elise, and I want her in life, and I want her at this time raising her family, being a wife, supporting her husband. Thank you that the, she has the gift of encouragement, a true gift of encouragement where she understands where people are at and she can speak right into them in the moment. Bless you, God. Praise you, Jesus. Elise, if I could just add to that or piggyback on that, you know, Josh was talking about how when Saul, who became Paul, got saved, no one could believe it and no one wanted to uh, get near the guy. No one wanted to let him into the church gatherings, but this one guy named Ananias, who also at first didn't want to get near him because he'd heard about how violent he was, but God clearly spoke to him, and Ananias was a God-fearing man. And, uh, uh, and then Barnabas came along and really helped Paul get um, become in the thick of what God was doing in the church. And I just feel like God's given you that kind of anointing of coming alongside someone who feels like they don't fit or maybe who the church might not uh, as quickly as they should accept. And you're just going to be the kind of person, and you've really done it with your husband in a way. You've kind of been uh, an instrument of just holding his hand and walking along with him in this journey back to the Father. So I just want to ask, Father, that you would anoint Elise to be your instrument to bring many to the Father. That she could see beyond the exterior, the rough exterior, whatever the person's lived like in the past, and could just see your hand, your pursuit of them, and be your instrument to help them come to Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We give the, Elise the new creation and a soft round of applause. All right, Jose. Come on up, Jose. You guys can sit down and go soak your chair. <laughs> All right. Hey, mister. Oh, this is a real privilege. Why don't you guys look at this man? 
Look at this handsome guy. So this is really special. So we got to know Jose a little more recently and his wife. And, uh, you know, they told me something kind of interesting. We didn't plan this, but uh, Keith, raise your hand. This is, uh, they're all family. This is uh, brother-in-law, brother and sister right there. And uh, Keith got baptized a year ago today on Memorial, Memorial Weekend in the same church. And when, when God rescued Keith and Keith said, I'm ready to be a man of God, as we were reminiscing about that in the baptism class, how Keith gave some funny answers to the questions. And we said, Keith, are you, are you going to follow Jesus your whole life, even if you're disappointed? He's like, I'm already disappointed. <laughs> some memorable one-liners. But uh, anyways, uh, look at this. We have, we have Jose here now. And this is really special, Jose, that, you know, God saw you and you weren't left behind. God's like, yeah, I want Jose too. I want him to know he, he belongs to me. And I want a new life with Jose. And, you know, it was really special when we saw you coming around. And, and I, you know, I thought it was really fun when you were telling me, you know, it was a little, little uncomfortable at first, but you pushed through it. You know, and church is weird. I'm still, it's still uncomfortable for me. It's weird. You guys are weird. You make me feel uncomfortable sometimes. But it's not just about the church, is it? It's about God, that he wants us. He wants our heart. And he wants you, Jose. And you've opened up your heart to him. And um, I don't know, Jose, this is just really special for me and for all of us to be able to witness that you, you've become his child. You've become a man of God. And um, no one can say anything about you um, because God gets to say he has the final word on your life, that you're his, you're clean, you're forgiven, you're a good man, you're washed by him, uh, you're empowered by his love, and you have a good future ahead of you. You're a good father, you're a good husband, you're a good Christian man, you're a good part of our church. Um, so we're just thankful that God's uh, done this in your life and in your heart, and we get to just agree with what he's already done. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. And uh, Jose, my first question is, have you placed your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Yes. Okay. Jose, have you, do you believe that he died on the cross for all of your sins? I do. Okay. Jose, this is my last question. Is it your intention to follow Jesus every day of your life by his grace? Yes. Okay. All right, Jose, is there anything else uh, you want to share? No pressure, but if there's anything you want to say, now's your last chance before we dunk you. I just want to thank everybody for making us feel welcomed. Um, you know, just thank you. Yeah. Amen. Cool. All right, let's get you in here. So... Why don't you stand about right here so you don't hit your head? Keith's going to help us. Okay, Jose. Well, God has chosen you, so we're not choosing to do anything here. We're just going along with what he's done, and you've accepted him, so we're recognizing that based on your confession of faith, your decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> these are great towels these are huge towels they uh, looks like a robe <laughs> all right well hey who wants to who wants to um pray for jose raise your hand and we'll come to you okay so um father thank you for jose and uh his drive to step forward and accept you into his life. Um, I just want Jose to know that there are no more questions in your life that don't have an answer. You are with God, and God is with you entirely, all the time. And lean on him entirely and fully. Know that he is always with you in anything, in any endeavors that you want to embark on, and any type of uh, decisions that you make, God is incorporated in that, and he will always be there to guide you and lead your path straight. He will make you a whole brand new person, and I'm eager and very excited to see the transformation that's already been taking place. So, Lord, just continue to make this what you want out of Jose's life. Amen.
Anyone else? Jose. Like, here's one here. Oh, here's two. I just want to say that um, <clears throat> the Lord delights himself in pursuing you, and it's not going to stop. And that um, this is a symbol to the world that you've changed your life, but the Lord wants to go even deeper with you, and wow. he wants to transform your mind. Wow. Thank you, Lord. And, uh, you know, all the... <clears throat> I just get this feeling that in the past, <clears throat> you may think that whatever you've done can't leave your mind, but he wants to heal all of that. Thank you, Lord. And that this robe, you know, as Josh mentioned, a robe going on your shoulders, it's symbolizing you getting clothed in power. And that um, he's really going to transform you, starting with your mind. Yes. So. Praise God. Hey, I saw a hand over here. You want to pray? Okay, can you bring a microphone to this young man with the hat? Uh, hello, Dad. You're up here. Just wanted to say, I know for as long as I've known you and how long I've been here with you, you've always been here with me, and every single time I get off track, you're up here by my side to guide me, talk through to me, and let me know that everything that I do, you want me to make, you want to make sure that I'm on the right track, and that I don't make mistakes, that that like you have before, and now here you are making big decisions with your life on the right track, getting things together, and I'm proud of you. Love you, Dad. Wow. Hey, come up and give your dad a wet hug. <laughs> can you can you black hat too? What's is that? Isaac, Anthony. He, he's a, you want to hug him too? It's a moment to get a big wet hug. All right. <laughs> All right. Never mind. All right. So here we go. Melissa, you ready? Wipe those tears out of your eyes. This is serious stuff. Quit getting all emotional. <laughs> all right, come on out, mister. We're going to need your help, too, though. I like to have the husband's help with Duncan, the wife. Well, hey, Melissa. Well, what a gift. What a gift. Melissa, I remember um, I was driving down LOVR, and I had my headset, and I got you on the phone maybe a year ago. And, you know, Keith, I met you at Keith's baptism, I think. And, you know, I just remember saying, Melissa, I'm happy for Keith, but what about you? What's going on in your life? And... Basically, I felt like you were telling me, Josh, I know I'm going to get there. I'm just not there yet. I know I'm going to get there, though. I know it's happening. I'm just not there yet. I got to, you kept trying to tell me you got to tie up some loose ends and get some ducks in a row. <laughs> tie up some loose stuff before you give it all. And, you know, I kind of in my head probably laughed and said, oh, come on. But I think you knew how serious this would be when you gave your life to God, that you don't mess around. You do everything seriously. If you're going to get married, you do marriage seriously. If you're going to be a mom, you do being a mom seriously. If you're going to go to work, and the same with your, your choice to give your life to God, that it was going to be serious when it came time. So here we are. Here we are, and it's never, you're never going back, are you? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm happy that you got here and that God got you here. You know, he's been with you this whole time. Uh, I celebrate his decision to bring you to be his daughter. I also celebrate your decision to open up your heart to him completely and trust him. So I want to ask you a few questions, and then maybe you can use the mic. Uh, Melissa, have you trusted Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord? Yes. Yeah, okay. Do you believe that on the cross he forgave all of your sins, past, present, and future? Definitely. Okay. And is it your intention now to follow Jesus the rest of your days by his help? Yes. That's okay. All right. Well, this is kind of your last chance. Is there anything you want to say to let us know where you're at and how you got here? Well, ever since my brother invited us to come here, everybody's been so nice and welcoming that it truly feels like family when you're here. And just seeing the road that my brother went on and that it changed his life gave me even more reason to come every day. Mm. Yeah. And that, that love... Like the love of God's kids, it helps, huh? Like it helps, yeah. Hey, good job, church family. Good job. Well, so thanks for the honoring words you just gave to everyone. It's really special. Well, go ahead and climb in. Don't dunk yourself yet, though. We're going to help you. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, Melissa. Well, we're here to celebrate, to acknowledge, to declare who you are and whose you are, that you belong to him now. You're not... Melissa in the eyes of anyone else. You're Melissa in the eyes of God, the daughter of God, the princess. You're going to walk with him your whole life. And we're going to try to see you through his eyes, and we want you to do the same thing. 
And that's what we're doing right here. You ready? All right, so it's based on your confession of faith in Jesus that we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right. Well, congrats, Melissa. Let's, uh, let's pray for Melissa. Does anyone, if you just raise your hand, we can come to you with a microphone. There's one right there. As their mother, I think um, I'm a really worrying mother, but now that I see they both, I am so happy and blessed that they have God in their life that I can be at pe- I'm so at peace with that. And I thank this church, and I thank God for having him here. Amen. Thank you. Can we go ahead and step out right here? You start to trip on this towel. Oh, you good? Anyone else want to pray for Melissa? No. <laughs> you got this. <laughs> um, Melissa, I just want to pray um, the gift of legacy over you. You've been given God's legacy now, um, and God has um, welcomed you into his family, and you can start a whole new legacy, one that is not under your own strength, but is under God, and it's a blessing to be able to be a new creation and to stand in the gap for your children and for your family in ways that were not done for you, and I just want to bless you with that um, with that gift. And Lord, I pray that you would give Melissa and Jose new direction and um, just give them the uh, new holy picture of family and love and, um, and healing and prosperity, God. Melissa, one of the things that's given me great encouragement through the years is how many times in the Bible God says, I will. And I think he wants you to hear those words. I will. Melissa, I will help you in your work. I will help you in your marriage. I will help you in your parenting. I will help you in all the domestic responsibilities you have. I will help you sort through the past and disappointments and hurts and wounds in the past. God wants you to know, I will. He is so absolutely committed to you, to making you whole, to making you full of joy, to giving you peace, teaching you not to worry, not to fret, not to put on your shoulders undue responsibilities that he wants to shoulder. So I just bless you right now in the name of Jesus to experience his peace and to know his faithfulness, his absolute commitment to you to make you whole and prosperous and fruitful in every area of your life. Father, convince her of your commitment to her. Deep in her spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, let's give her a soft round of applause. All right, well, we have, we have one left, definitely not least, but last. Come on up, Jared. Man, what a gift to... Um, have your family here. So, well, Jared, here we are. Yeah. Same thing. I feel like a few years ago you let me know something crazy happened in your bedroom at night. And I don't know, I feel like that day marked you. Can you tell people about that? that um, you, you remember that night? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was dead asleep and. Um, out of nowhere, I woke up like I would never w- w- was asleep. I shot straight up out of my bed, and I just felt the Holy Spirit over me. I couldn't see anything, but I could feel it, and it was the love of Jesus and our Father, and there's nothing like it, and uh, I knew at that moment uh, what it was, and, um, and that's a reason why I'm here now. He came for you that night. Yeah, yeah. He marked you. And it, it took you a little to get here, you know, but 
but it doesn't matter. You're here. Yeah, you're here. And I think you would have made it eventually, but I'm so happy you made it now, Jared. Mm -hmm. We didn't wait 10 years or 15 years because you have a whole life ahead of you now as a, as a Christian man. And uh, I mean, this is special for me. I don't know if you know this, but me and Jared's a long, long time friend. Right? I had the privilege of meeting you in high school and playing basketball together. And we had, some, we had some moments that marked my life too, where we encountered God. And I've still been unpacking those miracles. Like, how did those things happen? Um, so I just, I think God's been after you for, for a long time. And, um, and sometimes we're our biggest hindrance to opening our heart. And I'm thankful that you've, you've pushed through whatever hindrance you have in here to let him have you and say, all right, God, I'm coming. Uh, I'm happy that you've, you're ready to accept a whole new life. This is not just for you a little upgrade. You're ready to give him your whole life. This is not a little self-improvement plan. This is Jesus. You get, you get it all. So I think this is the best, you know, and maybe, Jared, you could regret that you didn't do it sooner, but at least you're giving him your whole life now. I don't think there's any need to regret. He has it. He can do exponential great things with what you give him now. So, Jared, I, I got to ask you these questions. Uh, have you placed your trust in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Yes. Okay. You believe that when he died on the cross... Just like his word says, he forgave all your sins, Jared, past, present, and future. Yes. Okay. And Jared, are you ready to follow Christ by the power he gives you for the rest of your life? Yes. Okay. You guys believe him? Yeah. Should we dunk him? <laughs> all right. Why don't you step in this tub? Is there anything else, Jared, that you wanted to say before we get started? You're welcome. My pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Yeah. yeah. You need to scoot all the way up. We don't want a, concu we don't want a concussion on this one. <laughs> That's not how these are supposed to go. <laughs> hey, Dad, we might need you too. He, he's a strong guy. So, all right. Well, Jared, this is God's doing. This is not something that we're doing as a church. This is not something that we're, you made a choice to do. Ultimately, God decided it's time to get my son back. It's time to get Jared back and have a life together. So we're just decreeing and declaring what he's already done in your life. It's based on your confession, though, of your faith in him, that we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Congrats. Come here. Oh, love you, man. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there's, you got hands going up everywhere. Oh. It just does my heart. You can actually feel the, the Holy Spirit come into your body. And, and to see my son turn his life over to Christ... It feels like my heart's going to explode. I love him, and he's one of three boys that I have. He does everything well, and I hope he does this well, too. <laughs> cool thing is how well God does it. Yeah, so, amen. Okay, here's one. Um, I just feel like that uh, this is a word, actually, for the family line. Um, and it says in uh, the word that I shall restore to you the ears that the locust, the swarming locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar have eaten in your family line. My great army that I sent among you, you will now surely eat and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wonder wondrously with you. Never again will your family be ashamed. You will know that I am within your family. And I am the Lord, your God. There is no other. And never again will your family be ashamed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Cool. Anyone else? Pray for Jared. 
think we should just pray. Was there someone else? Justin, go for it. Hey, Jared. Hi. I feel like I also got a word. Um, the, the first picture I got was a tree, and I'm like, okay, yeah, he's tall. Like, <laughs> is that it, you know? But um, it also had to do with family, just kind of what Heja was talking about. And in Isaiah 61, um, Jesus quotes this scripture when he comes on the scene. And uh, there's, a, there's a scripture in here where it talks about oaks of righteousness. And so I'm just going to read the context here, but I do believe the, the Holy Spirit's breathing on this for you. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And then it goes on and talks about garments of salvation and robes of righteousness and I just, you know, and it, and it says here, for as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. And so I just, I do feel like the Lord is, is I mean, he's come to you in a really powerful way, and that's not by accident. And I think there's going to be something that shifts with your generation, and that there's going to be this, this stability, this like divine stability to your life as a tree of righteousness that has deep roots. You're, you're, you're deep in the identity that God's given you, deep in who you are. This is a deepness that you've been looking for, but now it's like, okay, this is actually going to happen for real. And you're going to watch and you're going to see God do it. He's going to build these things in you. And you're going to be a, a firmly planted, anchored tree of righteousness. And um, it is going to affect your family generations to come. So thank you. Hi, Jared. I don't, I don't know you, Jared, but um, when I saw you come out of the water, I, I saw something. Everybody has DNA, right? Well, your DNA is going to change because now it's a designated nature of Abba. And you're going to be putting on a whole different nature than you've known. No past thing's going to hold you. All you have is a hope in a future. And you're going to cry a lot that it won't be for you. It'll be for others. And it's good. And it'll give you also vision to, as to what you can do for it, whether it's say nothing, pray. You're going to find the nature of the room changing just by you entering it. And if you ask him, you'll see it because you'll get used to it. So I'd encourage you, Abba, show me your designated nature and how the room changes so I can be encouraged. All right. Anyone else? I just want to pray for him. Yeah. Anybody else? Mm-hmm. Thank you, God. Father, I pray that you would help Jared know how you feel about him. I pray that uh, whatever sin has done to dull his feeling, his ability to know you, feel your presence, sense your nearness, that you would undo that, that you would heal that. God, that Jared would just be amazed. That everywhere he goes, everything he does, the living God is right there, delighting in him, pursuing him, and then increasingly choosing to use him. I pray that you would give him the joy of seeing healing and restoration, restoration of destiny on his family and his clan. And I pray that you would thrill him with how you intend to use him at Morro Bay High School, where he works. I pray that you would give him increasingly your heart for every person at that school. And that people would just be drawn to you through Jared. 
Thank you, God. Thank you for calling this man to yourself. Preparing for all that you're going to do in and through him. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can you give him a soft round of applause? Amen. Oh, oh, love you. Proud of you. You're awesome. Great job. So ministry team members, can you raise your hand if you're on the ministry team today? Higher? Okay, there's a few people. So there's people here who want to pray for you as we're dismissing. If you personally, you're like, hey, that's all nice that they got baptized, but I need some, some ministry or prayer. Um, I also want to give you the invitation. Someone in this room, you might not even be a Christian. We're not going to baptize anyone else today, sorry. But if you need to become a Christian, we don't want you to leave this building without making that choice to give your life to Christ. And if that's you today, you can raise your hand and the ministry team will come to you. You can just wave your hand and they'll come with you and they'll pray with you so you can receive Jesus into your life, into your heart, and you can become a Christian. Um, so, hey, can I have a couple of ministry team members come forward? Yeah. So, like I've said, if, if God's working in your heart and you don't want to just leave yet, you can find one of these people to pray with you. There's, all, there's other people who'd love to pray with you too. We'd love for you to stick around. We're going to start serving sandwiches, and we're going to open this door here. And then if you walk around this back wall, it takes you into the backyard, and there's chairs out there. And we'd love to invite you. There should be enough for everyone. Uh, so we'd love for you to stick around. Get to, I'd love for you to high-five the people that got baptized. High-five them. Tell them great job. So excited for you. Hey, thanks for being here. Love you guys. God bless you.